Poodle. Welcome everyone to the Design Society chat room. Um, today we have a special presentation for you um, by, uh, it'll be Pascal, will be Pascal Lameton, will be delivering the, the presentation um, on just getting the title up just now. Uh, the interplay between design theory and creativity based on his own research work, I'm sure, but also the, the work of the design um, theory SIG um, that has happened over the, the years and uh, will be supported as well within the discussion by sub, uh, is someone Subramanian? <laughs> I need to practice Subramanian, that. Subramanian, yeah. Subramanian, yep. No, no. <laughs> and, uh, I hope you'll all enjoy the, the, the presentation and the, the discussion that we'll, we'll have from this. But just to, to kick us off, I want to introduce the Design Society to you in case you um, are not aware of who they are and perhaps would like to, to join the community. So the Design Society is an interdisciplinary community of academics and industry practitioners with the goal of developing and promoting a robust, usable and scalable means of designing solutions to complex problems that a sustainable and globalized society need to thrive in the 21st century. What that practically means is that we are around 900 current members um, from 48 countries worldwide. You might be able to see some people in the, the picture in the background there that you recognize. And uh, what the Design Society does is to organize events and, and disseminate knowledge. And it does that through access to research papers and theses, awareness of events that are coming up, calls for papers and jobs, reduced publication fees, reduced event registration fees, and uh, also the support to develop your career within academia and industry in design. But also for our younger members, there's also information about PhD summer schools, young members events, interactions with peers and different resources for young members as well. If you have a particular interest, for example, design theory, um, you might like to join one of the special interest groups and you can see a list of the different groups here or visit to our website in order to learn more about each of the individual groups at designsociety.org. And so I'll pass over to Pascal and um, if you'd like to share your screen and you can begin the talk today. Thank you, Ross, for the introduction. I share my screen. Uh, yep. Uh, sorry, I, I don't see you anymore. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to, to ask me. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. For Thank you very much to the Design Society also for the invitation. Actually, we prepared this presentation, uh, Seb and I together, uh, and we see that as a kind of presentation of the works done in the design theory SIG, and not only mine works, of, of course. And um, the design theory SIG, yes, yeah, sorry. The design theory SIG uh, is today a quite large community with uh, several hundred uh, people connected to, connected to the SIG, and we have a, a regular a yearly meeting taking place usually in Paris early uh, each year, so in January. And um, this is a, a, a SIG of the Design Society, so we are very happy to have the, the regular support of Design Society. And uh, we have also strong interaction with other SIGs, in particular with the Design Creativity SIGs, SIG, with a regular presentation from their chair, men and women. Uh, we, let, we welcomed uh, Toshia Taura, Yukari Nagai, Gaetano Cassini. And this interaction is one of the reasons why we wanted to discuss that, but not the only one, of course. Why, speaking of creativity uh, from the point of view of the design series SIG, a first justification is a professional point of view, because creativity is a kind of enigma. Uh, for an industrial designer, creativity almost means design. But for an engineer, creativity, on the contrary, is the moment where engineering science ends and uh, we uh, leave optimization and decision for something different. Still, others in engineering uh, field, in the engineering field, claim the contrary, and they say that there is creativity in engineering, and again, we can go back to the 19th century or cite our dear colleagues, uh, Tawaha Nagai, Tom Howard's work, or even the, the reference book of Pal and Bites will say that there is creativity in engineering. So this is quite intriguing. Uh, the relationship between creativity and, and design is strange, and we could hope <clears throat> we could hope that the role of design theory is maybe 
to provide a common language to all these professionals. The, the second point that um, pushed us to, to discuss creativity is that uh, this is an interesting phenomenon and that appears, uh, creativity is an, an interesting phenomenon that is addressed by several disciplines, in particular, creativity research. But these disciplines uh, have feet in different academic fields. So design theory is more in engineering design, whereas creativity research is much more in psychology. This means that on this phenomena, there are different lights or different perspectives, and it could be interesting to see how these different perspectives could combine and maybe help to uncover interesting facets. So what does it mean to interact fruitfully on the uh, creativity topic? Well, here we have to be very careful. Uh, this interaction should take place probably at different levels. And as soon as we discuss how creativity can nurture design theory, we have to distinguish the level of the models of thought, where we develop formal models of design, and we can test them, meaning testing their consistency, their explanatory power, their prediction, etc. At this level, the question is, does design theory as a formal model of thought account for creative thinking? And there is another level, which is the level of collective action, Again, we have the same logic of modeling and testing. And here, design theory is more a resource for developing new models of action. And we hope that this resource could uh, help uh, have model of action that goes beyond the deci collective decision making or collective optimization. And the question here is, how can design theory help develop new models of creative collective action? So just to distinguish and to avoid to confuse these two levels and to test one with the others, which would, of course, uh, raise issues. Now, how are we going to uh, address the point? The first thing we could do is, as we often do in the SIG design theory, uh, back to history and try to understand how, over time, design theory develop in interaction with creativity analysis. And we will uncover a very interesting dialectical relationship. Based on this, we will then wonder how design theory address creativity at the level of models of thought. And only then, in the third part, we will see how design theory might help to develop new models of action for having a more creative action. Historically speaking, uh, we can just pick a couple of moments, historical moments. The first moment is uh, Germany, 1840s. At that time, uh, design theory begins, and we have probably the first design theory for machines developed by a famous professor's, professor called Ferdinand Rettenbacher. And when he develops this uh, ratio method, for which he is very famous, he begins by stating that technicians of his time always rebuild the same machine, meaning that they have an, an obstacle, an impediment in the creation of new machines. And that's why it developed the ratio method precisely to help the technicians to be better designers, to design particularly water wheels that are more adapted, more adapted to their context. So in a way, newer and more innovative. Second moment with German time, early 20th century, the Bauhaus, again, a school, and again, a statement of the professors of this school. Our role as professors is uh, to say that uh, students are, of course, very creative, but their creativity is um, impeded is not, uh, and has to be liberated and strengthened. And the role of our teaching, they say, is to expand the creative gift of the students. So the same process, the idea is that there are limits to creativity, and this limit should be overcome thanks to uh, design methods and design series. Third moment, we jump 30 years later, and here is the birth of the so-called systematic design. And again, very strange statement from uh, Bosch and, and Hansen, uh, the, the, the first proponents, first authors of this systematic uh, design. And they say that the composition of complex uh, devices of their time is too much uh, relying on well-known building blocks, building rules, and they are too limited. And again, their goal is to provide a systematic design that support a systematic exploration of alternatives at well-identified levels, levels that we all know today, functional level, conceptual level, embodiment, or detailed design. So interesting point here, 
we see how, again, we, there is a diagnosis of some limits, and there is the idea that design theory and design method could help overcome the limits. So we see a dialectical relationship where we thought there is separation. Creativity diagnoses a poor performance and even tries to measure it uh, occasionally. It raises the question of methods for improved creativity performance. In a way, it uncovers the box out of which it's difficult to go. And design theory appears as a way to go out of the box. So there are these limits, and design theory tries to stretch the design capacity to overcome the limits. So immediately you understand uh, the question for us today. What are the limits of today or what were the limits in the past decades that push to develop uh, advances in design theory and how, how do these advances account for new models of thought and new models of action. This is part two to see what were the expectations and how do design theory, uh, does design theory address this expectation today. The expectation on, on uh, creativity in the last decades First, a diagnosis of a lack of creativity to face innovation challenges. Uh, we have good design theory to address a fixed list of requirements, but what if you have to design the usages of a given technique? This is exactly what we have to do with data today, designing new, new usages of data. What if the, the starting point is just a very broad innovation field, like smart mobility, inclusive cities, or local food systems? And what if uh, we have to design under very strong innovation constraints like carbon-free energy? And if we have to design under very strong constraints, this would mean that we have to redesign the design rules. Second diagnosis, second expectation on design theory, we should be able to have a design theory that accounts for so-called radical originality, which means the modification, the transformation of the generative rules following Bowden 1990. And the design theory should account for rule breaking, rule creation, definition of new objects, and if new definition of new object, reordering of knowledge. So something that is extraordinarily complex and not really addressed by the uh, available design theory at that time. We know how to connect design parameter to uh, functional requirements where we know the two dimensions and the technologies. But what if we have to increase the list of function, increase the list of design parameters, and change the technologies to address uh, both uh, uh, areas. And third, and not least, uh, the cognitions uh, and the research studies on creativity told us that if you want to do this, be careful because we are not, we are human beings or human brain, I don't know, we are not really adapted to this process we will always be fixed by existing knowledge, existing definitions of things. And there are fantastic uh, uh, studies, phenomenological studies that describe this fixation effect. I won't go too deep in this. There are many, many, many references. But what is interesting is just to, to try to give you an idea of this uh, contemporary fixations. Suppose that the creativity exercise is to make a square by moving just one match uh, on the figure here on the schema here. And of course, there is a tendency to move all the matches to make uh, a, 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 a square, but we will uh, be unable to immediately understand that a square is not necessarily a geometrical shape, and a square can also be a mathematical operation, so that this uh, figure here is a four, and the four is a square of two, and can be considered as a solution to the problem. This is precisely a fixation, and uh, there has been many, many works done by our colleagues, Finker, Ward, Smith, Janssen, and I uh, would like to refer you to the very interesting study made by Nathan Creeley on the variety of fixations occurring regularly because of uh, the capacity or the difficulty of designer to uh, go to new knowledge. So we have these three expectations. What are our means? We could rely on uh, existing models of thought, which have been developed more in decision theory. And here we have good models of thought. They are based on knowledge, but they are very poor generativity. It tells you how to choose between known alternatives, not really how to design a better alternatives, better than all the one you know. Or you could rely on creativity research, but be careful here, we have a problem. There are interesting generativity measures, interesting studies 
of generativity phenomena, but the knowledge background is always implicit, leading to some contradictions or aporia. For instance, a very famous distinction in creativity research is the distinction between convergent thinking and divergent thinking, but there might be some kind of false creativity in divergent thinking, as long as you forget to consider some general physical principles, for instance. On the contrary, you could have very interesting creativity in convergent thinking if the convergent uh, designer is able to find an interesting technical solution to a crazy idea. So finally, this distinction is not self-evident because of the knowledge background. The role of expertise is also quite fuzzy. You could consider that expertise is a source of fixation, but it, also be, it can also be said a source of creativity. So this fuzziness of the knowledge background is a problem and it bids us to really completely rely on creativity research models. So we need a design theory that meets the three expectations mentioned before that has a level of modeling that is equivalent to decision theory, but include generativity that has the uh, capacity to account for creativity, but includes the knowledge background. There has been a lot of works done in this field, and uh, you could consider that all the theory developed in the last 20 to 30 years finally tend to address this issue. And I have here a list of uh, very interesting design theory series, which all more or less address the question of uh, fixations in, in design. Uh, here, uh, I will only uh, take one example with CK theory, which uh, in a way presents some uh, very good properties when related to the question of the creative uh, engine. Briefly, uh, how it works, you, you might know that uh, CK theory begins with a knowledge space in which all the propositions have a logical status, so this is the things you know, and you can even create knowledge inside the knowledge space by deduction, search, induction, etc. So you have a lot of possibilities to create knowledge in the K space. Design begins not with knowledge creation, but design begins when you are addressing a proposition that is neither true nor false. So inclusive mobility could be considered as a, a concept or uh, the carbon free energy or energy system could also be considered as a concept. And the model will, uh, will, tell, will tell you that if you want to design this uh, until now partially unknown proposition, you have to make it fully known. And for that, you have to create new knowledge and you see how immediately the design process in the CK process, the design process is responsible for creating new knowledge. And you have a first moment of expansion, which is a knowledge expansion. You create knowledge because of the concept you want to design. So imagination, you could say, supports knowledge creation. This is one first part of the creative power of CK theory. But this new knowledge can then be reused to uh, develop your concept. Of course, you could use so-called restrictive knowledge, so the knowledge you know on energy systems, but you can also try to wonder if there is strange knowledge that could be useful for your concept. A knowledge that wasn't used before, beforehand. A knowledge that is independent of the problem until now. And this knowledge will create a so-called expansive C partition, which will push you to explore quite unexpected direction for develop your concept. This is a second engine for creativity, the moment where knowledge create expansive partitions. So we see that there is a creative power in CK theory that is based on the interaction, interaction between knowledge expansion and C expansive partitions. By the way, it's also possible, quickly at least, to check that it meets the, the three expectations mentioned before. The theory will apply to any situation where there is a known, at least a propositional unknown, and the knowledge reference can be rich or complex, and the uh, starting point can be fuzzy or detailed. So we integrate the, the, the first expectation. We address, we meet the first expectation. Second, there is a possibility to regenerate the design route via K expansion and C expansion. And third, fixation. We understand that knowledge can be a source of fixation 
But this source of fixation will be controlled by the designer who will rigorously alternate from K to C and C to K. So there is a kind of possibility to rigorously control the possible fixations. With that, we see that we go from creativity issues to the development of design theory. And based on this, design theory appears today as a model of creative thought that is and it should be uh, proven in more depth, and you can refer to publication, uh, with the same level of rigor as decision theory, and uh, with a tested property, internal consistency, and capacity to address the expectations. We see that we have covered a first movement for creativity issues to design theory as a model of creative thought. And of course, the, the rest is now to wonder whether based on this uh, design theory development, we can now provide new grounds and new perspectives for studies in creativity on creativity phenomena. This is what we do in the third part. It would be very long to, to show you all the works that have been done based on design theory to discuss uh, creativity issues. We, with SUB, we decided to, to focus on two streams of work. The first one, the works addressing the question of overcoming fixations. And the second one is the works that precisely take advantage of the fact that design theory take into account the knowledge background. So the studies that show or see how knowledge structure can provoke some form of interesting creativity. Let's begin with the first. And here in this part of the presentation, I would like to, to show you in more depth how you can make use of design theory to address a creativity question. So I begin very slowly with, uh, for me, a very illustrative uh, publication made by Marina Gauguet and colleagues on the impact of type of examples on originality. The initial research question was, do examples fix or defix in an ideation or a creativity process? And the literatures, the literature at that time was very inconclusive with situation where examples were shown to defix and uh, other situation where an example was shown to highly fix. So open question. And how to solve it? What is interesting is that first, design theory helps you to formulate hypothesis. Because you could consider with CK theory that an ideator in a creativity process is a kind of CK operator. He has concept on knowledge, he uses knowledge and he has restrictive knowledge marked here with R. And when he uses restrictive knowledge, he, pro he produces restrictive concepts. But if he is able to activate expansive knowledge, he can produce more, he can produce more expansive ideas. An example in this framework can be chosen in the restrictive area. And then you can deduce that this example should provoke a restrictive partition. Whereas an example chosen in the expansive knowledge should provoke an expansive partition. So you can test whether example one, restrictive, will provoke fixation, and example two, expansive, will provoke a defixation. So interesting, you can formulate hypothesis, but it's not enough. You have to test them, and here there is a, a clear experimental problem. How do you test fixation? This is a true issue. You have a list of ideas with a certain frequency. How do you decide that this list of ideas is supposed to be a solution to a given creativity problem? How do you say that this list is fixed or not? Or that the ideator that provoked the list, that proposed the list, that generated the list, is fixed or not? You have two situations. Um, suppose that you have a reference, a reference, a red line. Maybe the list of ideas is finally only addressing the possible imaginable ideas, or maybe below here, the list of ideas is well covering all the imaginable ideas, and you don't know exactly. Is there a bias? How to measure it? There are several solutions to this problem. The first one is you make a very big sample size. This is a classical approach in psychology. Uh, you play on numbers. The problem is that it takes time and uh, you have a problem if you want to address very uh, strong, innovative questions. Second, conceptual assessment technique. Cat, you rely on expert judgment and you, ex you, you hope that the uh, experts uh, cover the red line. 
but it's not sure. And interesting studies have shown that the red line can be itself biased. So you have fixations in the red line. With design theory, you can try to draw the line yourself. So the experimenter can try to draw the line based on CK theory or any design theory, and then compare the idea to the CK-based red line reference. So now uh, let me show you the protocol, the experiment protocol. You define a design task, make uh, the, the you, are, you are designer and you are supposed to propose as many creative solutions on the following design issue. Make that an end egg launch from 10 meter A doesn't break. This is an interesting design brief. Then the experimenter yeah. prepares. I, I also stop it. Please, they care more about the Sorry. I propose that we finish the presentation and then we, we raise questions, all the more so that uh, I can't uh, see whether there are questions in the chat, which makes a, an imbalance here. So you can, uh, pre the, re ex the experimenter will prepare the referential, and uh, in this referential, it will be able to draw the red line and uh, identify the restrictive rezoning, identify the expansive rezoning, and then diagnose possible fixation based on the ideas pro proposed by the ideator. So the second phase is to make the experiment, first without example, to diagnose the fixation. This is a result here, without example, four and five ideas fall in the restrictive area. So there is clearly a bias and the bias is related to restrictive rezoning. And second part of the experiment, you then, then propose an example before the ideation process, a team is proposed with the example of a parachute, and you see that the parachute example provoke a, a decrease in originality, whereas, it, and the parachute is clearly from the restricted area, but another team is proposed to consider that uh, a solution could be that you tame an eagle to catch the, an, the egg when falling. And this uh, example taken from the expansive knowledge area provoke the expected um, expansive partitions, so the defixation uh, process, and you see that there is a clear, clear gain in originality. So um, this paper shows how a design theory can be used to clarify hypotheses and to uh, adapt a, a, an experimental setting, and you see that in this case the hypotheses are verified. And you understand that uh, with this paper we have a kind of a technique to really discuss the question of overcoming fixation, we have a clear possibility of protocols, experimental protocols, and many colleagues have developed interesting studies in this direction. Just to mention a few, uh, experimental protocols were developed to test teaching methods for uh, young children. Here you see some picture of this experiment made by Anna El Camarda. Uh, or American colleagues, they also developed very interesting uh, teaching methods for teaching biomimetism to engineers, and they exactly follow similar protocol on fixation and defixation through biomimetism. Uh, works were done also on leadership, how a leader could give not only examples, but instruction to defix his team. And here I refer you to the fantastic works done by Isha Mezat and now Justine Boudier and their colleagues, Mathieu Cassotti, uh, Marina Gauguet, etc. A very interesting works to show that it's possible to have a defixating leader, someone who is able to give instruction to his team, and the team will be defixed thanks to the leader without the leader being himself, herself, an innovator. Experiments were also done to were also done to analyze fixation and defixation, not only at the individual level or group level or team level, but that directly at the industry ecosystem level. Marine Agogé again, she, uh, was she was able to diagnose fixation on the general question, how to find innovative solution to support autonomy of elderly people. She checked innovation projects at the EU level and French level, and she has shown that all the projects were in the restrictive area. And she has checked that it was much more related to a cognitive effect than an economics effect. So some industrial organization can provoke orphan innovation, meaning that some areas of exploration are just not explored. On the contrary, uh, we were able to see that with certain specific organization, 
in semiconductor industry, they were not fixed. And maybe it's due to CK theory, but with CK theory, we were not able to diagnose a fixation in uh, some topics of semiconductor industry. And this is partially related to, exi to the existence of a strange organization, the ITRS, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductor, a global organization that coordinates the effort of exploration between all the actors of semiconductor industry. So we discover here a strange organization that finally support defixation. And here we confirm PSI, uh, this framework proposed by Joram Reich and, and Sub, uh, to connect the design rezoning with institutions. And we see here that institutions might fix and institutions might defix. Even more, it's possible based on this to go from theory to method and to propose method to collectively overcome fixation. This is uh, how LCK was transformed into KCP in companies to help those companies develop uh, processes to go beyond uh, brainstorming and beyond fixations. This was for the question of overcoming fixation. And you see how mod design theory could help uh, explore new frontiers in the question of overcoming fixation. Another direction of exploration was what kind of knowledge should be taught to, over, to, to be more creative, how to teach, and we are all professors here, how to teach students to improve their creative design skills. Again, this question is difficult as long as you don't have knowledge in your model. But if you have a good design theory that accounts for knowledge in your model, maybe it's possible to clarify how exactly knowledge can support creativity or impedes or impede creativity. This is a, a, a quite complex problem. I won't go too deep in this. After a thorough theoretical investigation, we have shown an interesting, um, an interesting condition, which is called the splitting condition. If knowledge is of the form deterministic rules or modular rules, this is a non-splitting knowledge and it will provoke fixation. It will provoke uh, restriction in creativity. But if knowledge uh, follows meet the splitting condition, then it's possible that this splitting knowledge has a strong creative power. We wanted to test it, and we test that on the Bauhaus courses, the one I mentioned before. And uh, we have shown that the exercises of uh, Bauhaus analyzed with CK could be interpreted as exercises to transform a non-splitting knowledge into a splitting one. So an exercise was, for instance, design a texture montage of contrasting material. In the knowledge, you have clear deterministic rules and clear independencies. And you see that the exercise itself will provoke new, uh, uh, new rules that uh, suppress determinism and new rules that suppress, um, suppress modularity. So we go from non-splitting to splitting knowledge. This is a, an example of a paper that used design theory to, to test an interesting property of uh, splitting knowledge. And again, this has opened frontiers for research to investigate how knowledge structures could impede or support creativity. But uh, we are running short of time. I won't go too deep in this, but I refer to the very interesting paper of Juliette Brun or the one by Sylvain Lanfle, who are showing that a certain form of uh, knowledge structure could support or impede creativity. With this, uh, I have shown you that uh, on the one hand, we went from creativity issue to uh, uh, design, new design theory, new model of creative uh, thought. We have shown also that this new model of creative thought can provoke uh, interesting investigation in the, the creativity research. And I just mentioned two, but I, co I, I can, uh, we, you could go uh, deeper uh, looking at how, based on uh, this model of creative thought, you can uh, look at the design of decision in the unknown, uh, creativity in software, creativity in invention, uh, in particularly uh, uh, patent in, patented invention, uh, creativity in scientific objects, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So many new frontiers today to go from design theory to uh, the study of interesting phenomena in, in creativity. All in all, what is interesting is that if we try to summarize what happens, this, all these works have finally led to identify and characterize generativity regimes, their conditions, 
their capacity, their instruments and their method. And we see that step by step, based on design theory, it was possible to explore these generativity regimes. And there is here a, a, a new world to, 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 to explore. And second, recent works have also finally uh, had to close the loop or reopen the loop, we could say, because in these generativity regimes, we have seen step by step that the question of uh, rule breaking was only part of the problem and rule preservation, tradition preservation was also important. Look at all the problem with sustainability. Sustainability, of course, needs innovation but not a destructive innovation. We necessarily need something that is also preserving what is already here, preserving nature, for instance, preserving resources, but also preserving culture, etc. And uh, here we see a new question. How can design theory account for innovation and preservation? Is this only a, a kind of poor trade-off or are there interesting models of the capacity to be creative in preservation. This is something that we are now exploring with new version of CK, it's called CK Topos, that help to go beyond creative destruction and address the question of creative heritage, creation heritage. So you see, uh, this is a never ending process and, and this is good for research. And what are the key drivers behind this? Uh, you see, to, to to, to go on with this interplay, we necessarily need a, con need a constant improvement of formal models, constant improvement of design theory, but also a constant improvement of experimentation, experimentation capacities, capacity not only to have instrument, but also to experiment in areas that were maybe out of reach until now. And this is only possible with a powerful research community. And this uh, go back to the reason why we are here. This is very important that we have design society, that we have SIG, that where it's possible to organize this loop with people more expert in formal models, people more expert in experimentation that work together to entertain this movement. With this, I leave the floor for a question and I stop sharing my screen. I'm just going to add... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, stop. I just want to add one more thing. When you start concentrating on knowledge structures, there are many, many avenues. What Pascal pointed out about the use of topos, but actually is much deeper into mathematical structures and composition. Using category theory also provides a space for encoding knowledge preservation as well as the potential for composition. That is a completely different talk. Then there's the other part which Pascal alluded to uh, when he mentioned uh, the uh, organizational structure as an important component of the defixation processes. In, in the, there, there are lots of other experiments using simple PSI you can even do. Actually, it is similar to the uh, experiment that was done by Mark Gross and others in the 60s by giving two sets of people two games, one in which they could change the rules of the game, one in which they could not, So, and the composition of the people in it. So now you are able to start thinking about how to think about collective creativity and the composition of knowledge and the rules by which they play. Now that's a whole different lecture. We wanted to concentrate on one to say, but it has the same implications further in the rest of the, using the rest of the theories. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Sub, um, for the addition there. And um, what we'll do is um, open up to, to any questions that anyone has um, for Pascal and Sub uh, on the design theory SIG. And uh, if you would like, you can either unmute yourself, raise your hands, uh, or pop the question into the chat, and either myself or Freddie will, will pick up on it. Um, if you, uh, yeah, if you'd like to just start doing that, we do have about 20 minutes left to, to facilitate questions, so please uh, come forward. And everyone gets very shy. <laughs> Perhaps whilst we're, we're waiting on the first question there, um, Pascal and Sub, might you give us a few more details about the um, the events that take place in January, the, the workshop 
and the um, seminar that you use, that you run in Paris? Uh, yes, sir, please. What did you say? I thought you were answering. <laughs> so did you want to say, say that again, please? Uh, the, the question was on the, the event. Uh, it's Thank you, <laughs> Ross, to, to raise this point. Uh, it's true that if you want to participate and to, 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 to play with us <laughs> on design theory and creativity, you are more than welcome to, to come at the next right. design theory workshop taking place on uh, 31st of January and the 1st of February uh, in Paris. Hopefully in presence uh, or maybe online. We don't know yet. Uh, and if you want to, to present something, don't hesitate uh, to look at the call and, and propose an abstract for that. Uh, you are warmly welcome. Of course, I see that some of you already know the game. Uh, if you want to participate, you, you are, uh, of course, uh, warmly welcome. And we hope to have at least some of you in presence uh, next January. So I've got a question for you regarding um, the use of um, you, you spoke about knowledge and the fact that having certain knowledge of imbuing knowledge on to people and knowing what type of knowledge is suitable can have its own uh, have its own limit. And I feel that something I was reflecting on what, during your entire presentation was the fact that as you went through the timeline, you you sort of highlighted a series of either there were structures or there were technologies or there were processes mm -hmm. that could facilitate creativity. Is there not an argument to be made that by creating a technology, as it were, to facilitate creativity, you are then bracketing the direction your creativity can go in within the confines of the very technology that was there to facilitate it is there anything that's been any work that's been done on that or if you've got any point to that at all uh, uh go ahead pascal i have some thoughts on it <laughs> please please go <laughs> so i have already See, spoken it, a lot it, uh, uh, I'm not interested so much in the technology itself. Technology is a means which we are going to use. In the notion of creativity, how is the knowledge composed? Where is the knowledge coming from and how it is composed? Okay, I can talk all day to you about structuring information in computers and how we can facilitate creativity through that. But that's a, that's an augmentation. It's not the real problem. In fact, this is something I'm, I'm doing to some extent. I'm looking at different countries and the evolution of knowledge in these different countries and what is the difference? What are the social conditions which send the trajectory of creativity in one direction as opposed to another? See, it's the mobilization of knowledge in societies also determines the direction and where the creativity is directed. What we are talking about in a general sense, how composition of different types of knowledge or different uh, unconnected knowledge to deal with the unknown is how we are going to, we can, design theory can guide you in that. It's, 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 it is being separated from the technology. The technology is just to help you. Maybe it can enhance your composition of knowledge structures from different places, which you couldn't do before more easily. That's a, you see what I mean? I hope I answered the question. I think you have, yeah, thank you, Sam. That's, uh, that's, that's a good sort of reframing of, of uh, just, the whole just to, in general, yeah. I see that Amy Landers is here, and I remember her works on, on patent and patent law. And what is interesting is that in patent, where you have a, a clear problem, problem to clarify what is inventive and what is creative, over time, the knowledge structures evolved. And based on the knowledge structure, it was possible to better characterize new forms of creativity. So yeah. in a way, that is interesting. Of course, the, the knowledge structure will orient your exploration in a certain direction. But on the other hand, with enriched knowledge structure, you also enrich creativity. And this movement is a, a kind of never ending. Maybe the, the great debate for us is to better understand the variety of knowledge structures. If 
thank you both. That was, uh, yeah, that's a really, uh, those are some really interesting points and uh, helps me sort of recontextualize the, the thought um, there as well. We have a, a question actually in the in the, the chat. Um, do you see, uh, let me see, it seems yep. that the approach that you have presented can be applied to a single individuals, but also to organizations. Do you see any difference between individual and collective creativity fixations, etc.? Hmm. It's a very interesting question. I want to say no, okay? But at the same time, I'm hesitant to say no, okay? Uh, the reason why I'm caught in that conundrum is that is it the case that an individual exposed to a variety of knowledge as he accumulates, does his fixation decrease or increase? It's an empirical question which I cannot answer, okay? Number one, and then take collectives and say, if I compose people of different disciplines with different kinds and single disciplines, how do I see uh, that uh, 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 how do I see that in terms of composing them together, right? Again, the notion of splitting becomes very, very important. Societies which manage to bring knowledge from different places, either through colonization or otherwise, manage to compose that knowledge in interesting ways, and others didn't. So. There is a way, in fact, this is something which is dear to me, historically looking at how knowledge has been used in different places and what we consider creative in one place of the world versus another in the way we compose them. This really opens up all kinds of possibilities. So the individual and the collective may be that you are fixated on certain knowledge. My Indian colleagues might beat me up, the separation of knowledge through caste in India has been an impediment towards the kind of composition of knowledge that happened besides accounting for the fact that the British destroyed almost all the productive capacity in the physical materials and so on. It doesn't matter. Structurally, India has been in that state since, since 600 AD of the separation of knowledge. I mean, I can take this in many, many different directions to even look at the notion of creativity and direction of creativity. I'll stop with one example. You know that Japan invented the gun before the West. But then if we, uh, uh, they threw it away because it is not honorable to kill somebody from a distance. You see, this is very, very important to understand when knowledge composed is even thrown away. Uh, Albrecht, just a point for you. You are a too good epistemologist to, to raise this question. Uh, my answer would be, what, what is your instrument for seeing? It depends on your uh, spectacles. If the instrument is just originality, variety, etc., the answer will be no, you have a black box. But if the instruments also has a model of the organization inside, like preservation, like sustainability, then the criteria will contain the organization and you will have a different measure. Fantastic. We have another question from Chris. Uh, Albrecht, do you, do, you, do you have a response before we move on to the next question? So thanks. Uh, yeah, I think we can discuss later. It's a bit loud here, so I, I'll leave the floor to the others. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. So we'll move on to the, the question from Chris McMahon. And I, I should also say thanks to Chris, who was 
um, one of the, the organisers with us this summer on the, the chat room series and hopefully we'll be back next summer to uh, bring you some more events as well. But um, he's asked, is there a role for what you are learning in information policy at the national, even international level? What might be the message for COP26 next week, um, which is here in Glasgow? Hello, everyone. Um, uh, on the possibilities suggested by the new understanding of design theory and creativity. <laughs> uh, Sorry, what, what should I be telling to the, the international I, leaders when they arrive in Glasgow? <laughs> uh, first of all, you, you, um, I may be provocative. Scale is our problem. The more we scale, the more resources we use, the more everything you use, we have to figure out how to deal with scale without scaling, if that makes sense. There is a paradox there, but if that is the one that has to be solved. Otherwise, we are going to keep on moving resources and products all the time. That is not going to be, uh, won't solve that problem. That would be my simple, maybe you know, stupid message to these people because they won't listen anyway. <laughs> but that's the paradox that has to be dealt with. Uh, for, for the COP26, Chris, I don't know, because as, as Sud just said, we are immediately in a political game. So we can discuss that. This is a, a kind of organization that uh, asks for a specific form of rhetoric. But if it comes to the question of sustainability, and what we can do with design theory and creativity uh, in terms of sustainability, climate change, and transition. Uh, my impression is that first, I don't know in UK, but in France, uh, design and construction on engineering is surprisingly absent. And we are immediately uh, trapped into a, a decision-making problem with uh, uh, tons of sacrificial dilemmas. So either you save animals or you save uh, human mobility and, and uh, what else? Uh, either you have riots or you have poor people. So this is just uh, just uh, extremely difficult as a situation. And, and probably this is the role of the design society to remember, to remind that the question of the capacity to invent sus sustainable solution is critical. And... and mm -hmm. Again and again in the in the debates, what we see is that all students or engineers, they want to be able to invent the solutions of the future just by admitting that the available solutions are precisely uh, strongly fixed, probably. And we, we have to explain that we need more design capacities and more competences to invent the sustainable, um, sustainable solutions of the future. The second point is, be careful, the kind of design that will be required in these transformations might be different from the one we have known before. In particular, between, because designing sustainable might require forms of reasoning that are not the one our engineers are used to. The question of preservation, the question of natural development requires new knowledge and requires probably new ways of addressing this knowledge and dealing with this knowledge. And the question of Inter having different kind of designers, users, experts, etc., interact even nature, interacting together is a very complex issue. And for the moment, we probably don't have, we as researchers, don't have all the techniques and, and tools. So, so I, I would really have a, a, a plea for, uh, for, for, for design capacities and take into account the creative power and, and avoid the, all the, the decisional dilemma and or the sacrificial decision dilemma and probably push again and again on the question of what are the specificities of uh, sustainable design in terms of design reasoning and creativity. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much Pascal, that's great. I, I read the questions, so you may want to read quickly. I think I can answer both of them together in a way. <laughs> Yeah, go, go ahead, Sub. So there was a question from uh, John Jacob Santa Kentucky, who uh, said, 
Uh, when we talk about creativity, that relates to CK theory, is it more on statistics with knowledge? And uh, what kind of concepts can you can make with that knowledge, which may lead to creativity? And yeah, we've got, we've got about five minutes left, so if you want to, to finish yeah, up with that. Uh, I'll do it quickly. Uh, it is not about statistics. It's about the conceptual structures of knowledge that are available to you to be composed. See, engineering is composition of knowledge from different places to achieve a goal. That's what we are talking about, our structures of knowledge, not statistics. Yes, statistics may play a role in doing something, but not necessarily the primary part. Uh, I'll remark on the second next question also quickly so that Pascal has. Uh, uh, Sanders said to embark on my notion of scale, a colleague of mine suggested we need to scale experiments rather than solutions. He's absolutely right. And there are people who are doing that. In, in India and other places where they are not, they're doing experiments and then working with, uh, uh, that's what I call scaling the small, okay? Not scale the other way. Prisca, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, the, the question of statistics is interesting, but uh, <laughs> that question is interesting, but it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, there is a theoretical problem behind this. Uh, that we have to mention, uh, statistic is uh, really reluctant to generativity. So, so as soon as you have a, a, a statistics, you have a, a fixed reference. It can work but from time to time, but be careful. Uh, statistics is uh, intrinsically limited to account for generativity. And that's why we have to be very careful on statistical approach. Of course, uh, with very general uh, sizes like uh, fluency, originality, etc., it can work. But from time to time, it's not enough. So be careful with statistics. I am teaching right. statistics. I know what we can do with, and we um, try to know what we can't do with. Um, so yeah. the, the, the question of experiment is really interesting. Again, I will be also very careful. What right. exactly means scaling experiment? Uh, we, we tend to know uh, experiment from a decision-making and statistical point of view. And, and we speak of scaling experiment. We think it's just increasing the sample size. Uh, again, this is not true. Uh, mm. In the case of design, uh, the, the rocket doesn't work once among one million. In the end, mm. it works 100%. <laughs> so it's not a question of chance and likelihood. You change the probability. The design is to change the lottery. This is deeply different. It doesn't mean that it's not experimentation, but it is experimentation in the unknown to step right. by step know what it is about. So the kind of experimentation is completely different. This is why it's so difficult to manage proof of concepts, for instance. The, the POC, the, the POC is a buzzword today, managing proof of concept for uh, having a balance between learning and exploring is highly difficult. Uh, we have a colleague working on this, Caroline Jobin. She got an award on the last I said, precisely because she underlined that managing POC is highly demanding, it has to be very careful regarding the theoretical framework behind it. I want to make a funny remark. There is a paper you guys might want to read sometime. It's called Statistical Parrots. It's about natural language processing, saying that what we are creating are statistical parrots, and we need more and more and more computing in order to make these statistical parrots make any meaningful sense. And is it really we are going after language understanding, or what are we after? There are very interesting questions there, and I'll leave it. It is very similar to the question of what did, what role statistics play. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, just in time for one minute left to, to summarize um, at the, the chat room today. So I'll, I'll put into the chat um, some information uh, about the design theory sec, and you can go to the website to learn more about the, the great work that uh, Pascal Sub and, and the rest of the design theory sec members uh, contribute towards and obviously the events that they, they run each year as well. So thank you very much, Class Gallants Up, for being our chat room uh, guests today and for everyone for attending. And uh, hope to see you at a future chat room as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And looking forward